In this video, our conversation on uplifting research and technology development in Pakistan continues. Uh, I recommend that if you haven't seen the previous video, you should do that because that video set the context for this one. Um, in previous video, uh, essentially, I've explained that uh, uh, why Pakistan needs its own indigenous technology development uh, through R&D, research and development. Uh, and mainly the reason was that uh, imported technologies, uh, d they do not always uh, fit in well in our own production cultures, uh, be it in the industry, the agriculture, livestock, or any other field. Uh, so Pakistan will always need its own indigenous research and development to develop solutions which are suitable for our industries, our people, and of course the affordability of the locally developed solutions is another added benefit. Now, in this video, we'll uh, focus more on the uh, strategic framework. Uh, the strategic framework I presented to you uh, around a month ago. Uh, it, it's been uploaded in, a, in an infographic format, uh, and in this video, I'm going to explain. Uh, that strategic framework uh, in a little bit of more detail, uh, hopefully to build a better understanding. Uh, I'll repeat again something that I've shared in the last video as well, that uh, most of this uh, strategic framework is based on my working with the scientists in agriculture and livestock sectors. I've, in the last four years, I've worked very closely uh, with the government institutions uh, in livestock and in agriculture, and I've been able to uh, work and experience uh, the, how the scientific communities work uh, based on these uh, two sectors experiences, my experiences in these two sectors. My feeling is that uh, the situation will be quite similar uh, in the other uh, research sectors such as industries and medicine. Uh, but if it is not, then please do highlight by commenting in, uh, in the spaces given below. Uh, so let's move towards the uh, strategic framework. Uh, the strategic framework has has got five uh, distinct uh, steps uh, and I'll take you through these steps uh, but first I'll just quickly announce them. Uh, so the step one is uh, making the research demand responsive. The step two is uh, investment in human competence. Uh, step three is uh, deploying a research management information system. Uh, the step four is commercialization of research and development. And finally, the step five is to increase our research and development spending. Uh, so let's go through these steps uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first step of making the research demand responsive, what it really means is that uh, research is there for the sake of building technologies uh, for our farmers, for our industries, from our medicine and so on. So unless uh, this research uh, addresses the specific challenges that these people uh, are facing. I mean, doing research for the sake of research is, is not good enough. So, understanding the specific technology, technological needs of uh, Pakistani businesses, be it in agriculture, industry, and then finally designing our research that can respond to those technology requirements. In terms of expecting from our scientists, I mean, they're brilliant people, they are trained for the science, but uh, commerce and trade and industry is not their uh, forte. They are not experts in these areas. So it is not fair to expect uh, from our scientists to do this work. And I believe that it is best done through putting in place the institutional mechanisms whereby uh, people uh, with expertise in mapping uh, the technological requirements within the industry, within the agriculture, medicine and so on, uh, they should be uh, given the task of mapping these requirements and then handing over uh, it to the scientists so the scientists can fully focus on uh, their science which they are at, uh, best at and rest of the work in mapping of demand is, is left for people who are experts in that. Uh, right now uh, that kind of institutional mechanism, we've done a, a number of experiments uh, but that kind of institutional mechanism uh, which is effective is perhaps not in place so we need to do uh, certain more actions, put a uh, certain more focus towards making uh, this happen. The second point is that of uh, investing in the human competence and, and, and again in any other sector uh, the, the, the machine can take a lot of burden off uh, from, from the human beings uh, but science is, is different in, in this regard. The, the most important asset in, in a scientific research 
is the quality of a scientist. Uh, so hiring good scientists, paying them well, uh, making sure that we are able to retain them. Uh, and scientists, I mean, the science is uh, always at the cutting edge of innovation. Uh, they are always operating on the border lines. And, they, and therefore, they can uh, get outdated pretty quickly. So make sure that these people are continuously being trained, updated, upgraded. Uh, investing in the human competence, I think, is much more important uh, in research and development than most of the other fields that uh, we, we uh, see. The research management information system uh, is required because uh, most of the science in Pakistan is mostly done in the government institutions and our uh, reporting mechanism is still based on uh, the British era uh, filing system, you know, those big fat files, uh, you make a comment on that, that them and then you move it to the next person and then they make a recording on them. Uh, so a lot of information is really, uh, you know, lost under the piles of uh, files and papers. You know, we have a much more efficient uh, uh, systems can be implemented uh, through I, uh, information and communication technology and uh, I believe that all this information which is lost, the knowledge which is lost uh, under the weight of paper and the files can be brought forward and of course the monitoring of research and development will also improve because an information system can do both these things. It can be a repository for the knowledge and it can also track the development of knowledge and uh, be a monitoring and evaluation system for the performance of our research. So uh, again, a research management information system, uh, perhaps a centralized one, uh, will be very important uh, in making research and development uh, vibrant and efficient in our country. The fourth step is that of commercialization of research. Uh, like in case of uh, making the research demand responsive, we have discussed that uh, you know scientists they are best in doing their science, and there are other people. Uh, so you need to make these institutional arrangement uh, with people with expertise in commerce and trade and so on uh, to take care of the business part of the research. So similarly in, in commercialization of research, a lot of time there is a lot of research output which is uh, there, which is for the benefit of the industry. It can actually benefit the industry and the farmers and the agriculture, but it's just lying there in the research labs uh, because there is no proper mechanism to push these research finding out uh, through institutional systems uh, in the industry, in the commerce, in the trade, so they can benefit from it. So building an institutional mechanism uh, which can uh, first of all make the research demand responsive and then when uh, later on when the research produces certain outputs, then pushing those uh, research outputs into the industry either through auctioning or giving it out to the industry through technology various channels. Uh, in technology transfer, um, I think that kind of institutional arrangement is also needed. So not only that on one side our research is responding to the demands of the industry and the farmers and the agriculture and so on, but it is also going out to the farmers and the agriculture and uh, industry when the research uh, reaches a certain uh, logical conclusion and output comes out of uh, the research and development effort. And finally, the step number five. Uh, which is increase uh, in the spending of research and development. We uh, touched upon this topic a little earlier also. Pakistan uh, spends around 0.3% of its GDP uh, in research and development, uh, whereas India spends 0.9%. Uh, there are other, China spends over 2% of its GDP on research and development. Uh, so does UK, so does uh, USA. Uh, so not only that our systems uh, need to fix, uh, but also a lot more money needs to go into these systems so our research uh, communities can become more efficient. I have said 1% here that Pakistan needs to spend 1% of its GDP in research and development which is far less than what China, England, UK is doing. It still is like three, more than three times than what we are doing right now. So let's just take this first step initially and let's see where it takes us and perhaps in later year we can also target to uh, lift our research to even higher level uh, as high as perhaps 2% of the GDP at some stage.